Hello, uh, welcome to the webinar uh, focusing on uh, sports against uh, racism. I'm Vlad Spencer. I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C. I'm with uh, World Learning. Our co-moderator, Anata Debosian, is in Yerevan, uh, Armenia. Uh, this webinar is part of the International uh, Sports Programming uh, Initiative of the State Department's Sports Diplomacy Division and is produced by World Learning and Digital Communication Network, Southeast Europe Hub. The idea of this webinar originated uh, while uh, we're observing uh, the level of global contagion, I would call it, um, you know, in the good sense of the word, and, and active expressions of, of support uh, for the African American community, other communities of color, following several tragic events in the United States. Um, as well as the global reach of the expression uh, Black Lives uh, Matter. Uh, as we all know, uh, all over the world, from large organizations like FIFA or UEFA or, or NBA uh, to other professionals or amateurs groups or individuals, racism uh, has been uh, rejected powerfully and, and uh, in most cases effectively, successfully, as it should be. While a tremendous progress has been um, made fighting races, those dark uh, impulses, unfortunately, are, are still part uh, of sports and are still part of social reality all over the world. And, and that's the reason almost weekly we, we hear about incidents, players uh, reacting to uh, racial slurs or fans chanting uh, or, or showing insulting banners. And, and while sports, are increasingly integrated in, in terms of ethnicity and, and, and uh, you know, religion and, and, and race. Uh, teams are mosaics of colors, again, of ethnicities and countries. We're often reminded that uh, as a reflection of life, sports also mirror uh, sometimes prejudice and discrimination and hatred and racism. Our global panel uh, will address uh, today all these issues. We'll talk about the current situations and we'll also um, talk about how to combat uh, racism through sports. We all know by now uh, Zoom, we are all too familiar, uh, you know, for unfortunate reasons with this technology. We, we really count on your questions in the chat room. Uh, and keep in mind that our goal uh, is not only to have a you know, vigorous conversation about this important topic, but it is also uh, creating a network. So please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do, um, you know, and, and um, any link that might contribute to uh, the better understanding of the theme. Um, we built through this webinars a network of, of more than 100, 1500 people actually in more than 17 countries, uh, which proves that even during COVID we can uh, together accomplish a lot and hopefully the session today is going to be a reflection of that. So this being said, I want to uh, thank very much uh, our, our panelists from all over the world. We really appreciate your time and, and commitment to uh, this issue and to what we are trying to accomplish. And uh, Anna, you have the floor. Thank you, Vlad. And this is really very important topic for everybody, mostly, mostly in sports. And now I will go through our uh, speakers and we'll see uh, their perspective about this issue. So our first speaker is Julia Bellas. She's a sport journalist from Brazil. Julia, welcome to our webinar and let's hear from you what's the situation in Brazil. Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, so I'm a sport journalist and I want to start by sending my solidarity to all COVID victims, families and loved ones here in Brazil. Uh, we are still in a huge crisis with slow vaccination and little support from the federal government. So there are thousands of people dying every day and most of them are black. And this is only one way to show how Brazil has is a complex country and there's a lot of miscegenation with black and brown people being the majority, but at the same time, they have the worst social indicators in the country. And we also have indigenous people being forced out of their lands and less than being 
considered less than 1% of the population, which also makes them invisible to public policies and, and uh, you know, debates like racism in, in sports. But I'm going back to talk to, about the, to you about the Black community here in Brazil. And we are still a majority, but there's a myth of racial democracy in Brazil, which is basically saying that there's no racism in Brazil because there's a lot of miscegenation. Everyone has uh, some kind of uh, descendants from a Black community or from an indigenous community. So there's no idea of racism here in Brazil, which makes the cases we hear of isolated cases, which is not true. Uh, racism is a structure, so uh, is in our structure and the, com the country was built in a race racist structure. And sports newsrooms are not <laughs> too different from that. Uh, they are occupied mostly by white, straight, cisgender men from upper class black backgrounds. And there's a lack uh, of women of LGBTQIA plus people and of black and brown professionals. And this affects the sports new coverage. I'm going to talk about my own uh, perspective because I'm a sports journalist and I've been many, many times the only black person, the only black woman in a newsroom or in an environment, in a sporting environment, aside from athletes. So, from the past few years, uh, there's been a change of how the media, sports fans, and the justice system look at racism in sports because of uh, many movements by, by the Black community and works from people who work in sports and are trying to fight racial discrimination. I'd like to highlight the the work of the Observatory of Racial Discrimination in Football, which is a Brazilian organization that has uh, been cataloging and indexing and highlighting the, the these discrimination cases to make sure that people understand that these are not isolated cases. This happened uh, in, a, in a high number here in Brazilian sports, not only in football, but especially in football since it's the most visible sports in the country. Um, they release an annual report that goes, that is uh, published on the media, that is discussed in events, that is taught in schools, and this has been a real inspiration to, to understand how uh, racism is built into the, the sporting world. And here in Brazil, we still see players and employees from clubs, from federations that are still too afraid to talk about uh, racism to denounce when they suffer racism and but there are still people trying to fight it there are still people trying to work to make sport uh, not only uh, a, a tool to fight racism but also a safe space for everyone so uh, I'm not going to take too long out, out talk more when you ask me questions, but there's a lot to be done here in Brazil. It's a country that has a uh, little diversity in leadership, leadership positions in, in the sporting world. It's not different. And uh, there's a need to educate, need to educate players. players. Yeah, to educate players and teach clubs how to support their sports people, their players, their employees. So, and of course, there's need to a lot of action, especially considering the people who are in the power structures, but at the same time, there's a lot being done. Thank you, Julia. I'm sure that we'll have lots of questions and uh, we will talk more about um, how you use sports, how in Brazil you use sports to fight against racism. So I'll go to our uh, next uh, speaker, Dr. Francois Cleofas. He's a lecturer in Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Dr. Francois, welcome to our panel, and please tell us your perspective about the issue. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity I can have to engage and to talk and to share things with you. Um, South Africa is probably one of the most famous countries in the world uh, for creating the recall uh, changeover from a very apartheid past to a post-apartheid society. 
And sport is carried through with the myth still of the sport unites like nothing else. A quote to what Nelson Mandela made, made, made famous. And South African society at the, at the moment is anything but a united society. The COVID-19 pandemic that we saw just highlighted it, where there was this huge divide between people who could afford basic things like food, um, people could stay warm, and <clears throat> a large number of people were, as what Henry Giroux referred to as disposable people. Um, many people died uh, because of not being able to afford life, not being able to afford things. So in 1994, we had a a transformation of society. We did not have a social revolution. Uh, so what that mean, meant that those who had the economic and the social and the cultural power before 1994 could just transform themselves, give off the political power, but keep the social and the economic and the cultural and the cultural power. So before 1994, there was very strong left-wing um, socialist oppos opposition. Yeah, I think, I think we have some technical problems with Dr. Francois. Uh, well, we'll move to our next speaker before we reconnect with um, Dr. Francois. So our next speaker is Pavel Klimenko. He's head of policy at Fair Network from UK. Pavel, welcome to our webinar. Hi, Anna, and hello, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy as far as possible in these circumstances. And uh, the fascinating topic of our uh, panel today is, um, is at the core of our work at the Fair Network, we're a uh, global organization that deals with discrimination in sport. Um, uh, so I think we're currently in, a middle, in the middle of a very interesting uh, situation and some tectonic changes in sports that are happening in relation to, uh, to race and racism. Uh, we're seeing an unprecedented wave of athlete activism. Uh, which was catalyzed um, after the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and has uh, indeed been a bit of a positive contagion on, on all sports and on all athletes. And we've seen uh, players, football players, taking the knee in solidarity and, and in protest uh, in the UK and across Europe. Uh, we've seen national football teams of Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, speaking out about uh, migrant workers' rights in Qatar. We've seen footballers raising the issue of uh, uh, the situation of Uyghur people in China. We've seen a uh, Hungary national team player um, uh, speaking out against uh, repressive policies uh, targeting LGBTIQ community in Hungary. Uh, the places where it's difficult to, to raise these questions, but the athletes are finding their voice and assuming their power versus the existing structures. Uh, they're using their platform, their massive platform to speak not just about their experiences as minorities in the sport, uh, about the discrimination and barriers that they are facing, but also lending their voice uh, to discriminated communities beyond football. So reaching out to, to target the issues in, in, in our societies. So I think this is, this is a very important trend that we're seeing, and I, I'm convinced that we will, uh, we will see more of this athlete activism in the future. The big question here is whether this wave of athlete activism will have an impact on the structures. Let's remember that the governing structures of the sport of the biggest sport on the planet, football, remain largely white, male, and uh, their responses to, to athlete activism are largely 
lagging behind what athletes are, are raising. Uh, just last year, we had a debate in, in Europe whether footballers who are taking the knee or protesting against races with uh, uh, the name of George Floyd on their, on their shirts would face sanctions from FIFA. And it's, it's a good development that FIFA has decided not to sanction players for, uh, for their statements and, and reiterated their support to, to the fight against discrimination. But it's, it's not a given. You know, if we had a discussion about this, then it means that the goalposts posts haven't moved yet. Uh, so the, the most important thing is we've seen the responses by sponsors as well, by the regulators. Uh, but the question that persists is whether the words will match uh, the actions. So we're yet to see meaningful change, structural change in sports governing bodies and sports structures from the grassroots level up to, up to FIFA. And this, I think, remains one of the main questions uh, it, when we talk about athlete activism and its impact. Uh, speaking about Europe and in particular, we see that the movement for racial equality that is supported by, by footballers and by athletes has faced a backlash around Europe. We need to recognize that Europe is a majority, you know, white continent basically. And there are groups that are presenting the Black Lives Matter movement as a threat to their imagined identities. And we've seen backlash against fans in Czech Republic, Hungary, Russia, and the attempts to, uh, to politicize the, the, the movement for equality. So I think these are the, the main points that I wanted to, 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 to put across at the beginning of the discussion. Thank you, Pavel. Good points, good points. So we'll go to our next speaker from Israel, Dorn Lasker. He's a lawyer, member of the Beitar Nordia Jerusalem Football Fan Club. I think the most closest that work uh, in sports and uh, he's, I'm sure that you saw many, many uh, issues in, uh, in racism, like in sports and in the fan clubs. So tell us about your experience. Um. Thank you all. I'm gonna send you the, my, our Wikipedia page. You can read about us on the chat. Um, I'm Dor, I'm part of the fan-owned soccer club, Betan Udia Jerusalem, which is based in Jerusalem. It was founded in 2014. After in previous, previous years, a group of radical supporters of, uh, soccer club named Bitar Jerusalem uh, took over our fan base. So me and the other fans of Bitar Nordia Jerusalem were previously fans of Bitar Jerusalem, which is another team. Um, the fan base of our team was, I would say, hijacked by a group of very, very radical right-wingers. Um, it came to a point that you couldn't put any criticism about anti-racism in the stands, and uh, our the, the, there's no Arab or Muslim player in Beitar Jerusalem. Um, so we decided that you can't fight a radical power from within our soccer club, and we formed another soccer club, which name is Beitar Nordia Jerusalem. Um, in the last six or seven years, we're trying to form a strong and a brave group of fans that's trying to influence our home club, Betal Jerusalem, to make it unracist. Um, so what we're doing is we have a club, yeah, we, we're playing in the, well, in the third division. Um, and we have Arab players, which is very, very different than what we have in Beitar Jerusalem, which is a big, big club in, in, uh, in Israel. Now, my, my perspective about, uh, about uh, racism is that the way 
racist group works and why they sometimes win is because they work very, very organized and very, very determined. I want to share a story that happened uh, two months ago and illustrates how radical, a uh, small radical group of people wins over the bigger but moderate group of people. So uh, I don't know if, if some of you heard. So we cannot hear you. Don't. Door, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I, I, I lost my contact. So, a um, few months ago, there was an intention of a chic from the Emirates to become one of the uh, owners of Beitar Jerusalem. It was really, really big. It went to, I don't know, New York Times, it went global because the notion of an Arab owner to a club that didn't have. They didn't have any Arab player is unheard of. So we tried to support. Uh, we went to uh, to training of uh, our team, the Beta Jerusalem, uh, to support the, the deal, uh, to have an area owner to Beta Jerusalem. And it was from the two sides of the pitch, there was about 300 radical supporters from La Familia, which is the name of the group. And from the other side, 300 more moderate uh, supporters that supported the, 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 the deal. Um, in a certain point, the 300 people that was very organized, they all were, was wearing a black t-shirt and working together and the I don't know, leader gave the cue and they all went to the other side of the pitch and tried to bully us, let's say. And we were unorganized. We were not, we didn't have any leader. We didn't have any, I don't know, chance, even, uh, um, I don't know, t-shirt. We didn't have any, any leadership to guide us what to do. And when they came, they split us apart instantly. They used violence against us. But I think why, they, they, they succeeded in defeating us in that scenario, in any other scenario, is the fact that they were very organized. We didn't even have any sense of working together uh, to oppose them. Um, and this is what we're trying to do in the time of dear Jerusalem, to form a unite uh, group against racism. Um, and it's really complicated. I wouldn't say it always works. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Dor. You have lots of experience with us. I see. Okay, we'll go to our next speaker. He's a former professional soccer player. He's a founder and CEO of the Sane Foundation, Tony Sane from USA. Tony, welcome to our webinar. So let me unmute to you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I was I was born in different cultures. My my father was uh, born in West Africa. My mother was born in in Wisconsin. So I grew up in in two distinct cultures and um, had to figure out you know how to fit in. Um, you know, being involved in sports at a young age um, let me integrate when I visited my family um, in Africa. And as I came back to the United States, you know, without uh, knowing, with forgetting some English, uh, sports helped me acclimate. So I, I just want to um, point out how important it is how sports can 
can break down barriers and, and the power it has. Living here in Minnesota, which is the ground zero of George Floyd, and this week um, we've had another murder of, of a person that kind of sparks stuff around the world, it hits really close to home. And um, we know it's not on the football pitch, but it, it resonates with our community, um, how people see this. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of our staff are, are Korean refugees, and we know what's happening right now in Myanmar. So racism um, is affecting the world globally. And, and although we like to look and point at other places where it's happening, um, it's sort of everywhere, and we have to accept that. And I think that's why to, to be able to combat it, we have to work collectively and globally, um, even though every, every situation is different. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of, of the way athletes have, have stood up. And I remember playing in Germany for, for Hertha Berlin um, with a crowd of 70,000 people and they're throwing bananas on the field and making monkey noises when we played African players on the other team. Um, now the team in Berlin um, knelt in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick three years ago, um, you know, when America shut its back on him. And, and so they stood up. And so you see a lot of athletes um, doing things. And I think in this day of age of social media, we can organize quicker globally. The challenge is, is are we more effective? Because it's easy to get up and do something for two or three days. But is it really deep enough to force policy and institutional change? And that's where like when Martha Luther King marched in the 60s or they did the boycotts, you had whole cities and underground movements. And when they did something, it was taken really seriously because they knew that there was a power to make change. Um, right now, it's coming and going, but it, it hasn't been consistent. And so instead of having, you know, 2 million people march, we would rather have 100,000 people, you know, go meet and have breakfast with somebody from another community to get to know them. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about football is you can go anywhere in the world, two people can sit at the bar, turn on a game, and become friends. So although it has the power to bring us all together, it also has the power to divide us. As Pablo stated, in certain stadiums um, where people are threatened or in a place where it's supposed to be peaceful, when there's racist behavior, it can set everything apart. So here locally, you know, we, we do, um, we have 26 languages spoken here at our community center. We look at it as an inclusive environment, but we're also reaching out and we've partnered with Street Football World and Common Goal. And we're trying to do a collective and and not just in Minnesota, but around the country and then globally by listening to all of our stakeholders in sports and, and, and trying to figure out what is the climate like and what can we do? And then we will we'll, we'll build curriculum and collaboration. So um, this is going to be one of the common goal uh, initiatives that, that they announced. And, and we're glad to be a part of it and to lead this initiative. Um, because we know that sports should be something that brings us together. Um, it stopped wars before, and it's done so much. Um, and so we need to take advantage of it. But if we're going to do that, you know, it's got to be about leadership. It's got to be about more than money and sponsorships and dollars and cents. It's got to be forward thinking to change the game and truly understanding that, you know, what makes the World Cup special? It's the diversity. It's even when when you're playing your enemy, you're celebrating their success. Right. And so if we invest in sports in that manner and really believe in it, we will get the best ROI in the long term. So we can't be too short sighted uh, because oftentimes when we go to make change, things go backwards before they go forward. And it causes us to give up, but we can't give up. We have to make these commitments and move through it collectively, not just in Minnesota or around the country, but globally. So I'm glad to be here joining everybody. And I hope to learn from some of you and collaborate as well in the future. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. And um, Dr. Francois is back to our webinar. Uh, Dr. Francois, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I hear okay. you. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Don't know, I don't yeah, know can. what happened last time. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. Would you like <laughs> me to talk or would you like yeah. me to repeat? Um, okay, so I don't know where <clears throat> I stopped. Um, maybe I'll just start again over just briefly. And um, yeah. I, I, 
Yes. And I want I want to cap the much of your time. So um so the th so the thrust of what I was saying is that South African society at the at the moment is a very very divided so society. Those divisions that we had prior to 1994 is still visible. Uh, if you remember in 1994, um, the big talk that even that the world has, and South Africa had transformed itself. Um, basically, it was a economic and a so sorry, it was an economic and a political transformation. There wasn't a social, uh, a, sh a major social shift, a, revol a revolution as it were. So what happened was that the powers that be before 1994 could maintain the economic and the cultural power. They gave off the, the political power so that the school sports structures and the sports the sports structures that we had that were the dominant sports structures prior to 1994 is still is still very much intact of today and um things got got a bit muddled with uh, the idea of some in the party in of Sport unites like uh, I think else. Uh, at the moment, as I said, um, our country is not a very united country. Uh, we come together uh, around a, a short-lived World Cup tournament that we had in 2010. And then we go back to the divisions again. from our participants. Vlad, can you hear me? Yeah, I can I can yeah. hear you. Uh, we have some technical problems today with muting and unmuting. So uh, hopefully we, we lost Dr. Francois, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's, uh, you know, let's go through a, a few questions. So first of all, uh, you have to make to make sure that you also pay attention to the to the web uh, to the chat, because there are uh, you know questions, introductions, you know links being posted there. And as I said, you know beyond the discussion today, we our goal is to develop the network and to have you you know work with one another um, in order to uh, you know accomplish this, this, these goals. Um, now Anna is going to uh, look a little bit more uh, for questions there. However, uh, you know, one thing that I would like to, um, to, to do, and, and there's a question by Anatoly Korepanov that actually, you know, is connected to some extent uh, with a question that I, I, um, I saw uh, when people registered. You know, it is this phenomena that is actually interesting, Dor, um, you know, specifically referred to this, of fans, you know, falling into this category, not all of them, but some of them, into this, these extreme categories and, and expressing themselves in ways that are, are uh, you know, inappropriate and, 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 you know, not matching well the spirit of sports. And, and I was wondering, and actually somebody asked that, why is that happening? That means, you know, is this a global phenomena? Does it have explanations? You know, what, is it education? Is it maybe something that, you know, the clubs or the organization could do more in order to, uh, you know, contribute to, to make sports a more welcoming um, welcoming environment. Uh, so that's you know one of the questions that actually connects with the questions that Anatoly was asking, which you know he was referring at a specific tools and projects to combat racism. In addition to what you mentioned uh, mentioned before, maybe focusing on on young people because you know fans also are are the vast majority of them are young people. So uh, so that's the kind of the kind of the overall question uh, we'll go through members of the panel. So maybe, maybe we could start with Tony because you, you mentioned your experience in Europe in the United States and probably they, they are different and they have sem, se, certain similarities. So what do you think about this idea of, you know, this, this phenomena that is so visible among fans and what, what can be done? Uh, 
Um, I think with, you know, with, as far as, as far as fans go, I think, um, you know, clubs have to draw the line. Um, you know, I remember in, in, in uh, Berlin, um, where part of the fans were, were neo-Nazis and the club made a statement, right. And said, you're not welcome here anymore. And, and it caused a real stir. I mean, and it was history, right? It was a lot of fans. It wasn't like 2000, right? It was a big chunk. But um, we have to draw the line in the sand. But I also think that we have to find a way to educate fans um, so they're not threatened. You look at what happened in America with the last election. As there became a larger and larger movement around equity, um, there's a certain population that didn't understand it. And it was more about what's taken away from me and what's happening to other people. So I think we need to draw the line in the sand um, with the fans. But I also think um, that we have to find a way to, to educate them. And that means talking to their leadership and building it in. I mean, fan clubs are very organized, you know. So there is the possibility, you know, to get these large groups together to change if, if you can educate them. And the way that you educate them, I believe, is give them access um, to building relationships with other people. It's very hard to hate somebody you know, um, other than they're wearing a different jersey, um, you know, in some cases. So, you know, we're, we're working here with some, with some fan clubs, and it's one of the groups that we've said that, that we want to start because they do make a difference. They are in the stadium, and they set the precedent. You know, I remember sometimes – um, I had fans that would make monkey noises when I did it, but then it was 10% of the fans, but they make, you know, 60%. Eventually the other 80% of the fans, you know, started to drown them out and boo them, you know? And so I don't think we can all sit back and be silent. I think when we see something in the stadium, we have to point it out or, you know, you know, say, excuse me, what did you say? Um, because collectively there's more good people on earth than not. And so I think we just have to collectively use our voices and set the standard and fans and fan clubs are very organized. So we have to be intentional about educating them and we have to have dialogue with their leaders. And I think if we do this in football, it can change. And there's a lot of fan clubs now that are growing, you know, with philanthropic sides of it, you know, here in Minnesota, all the fan clubs reach out in the community and do philanthropic things and they all work to bridge racism and they don't tolerate it. Um, they have all kinds of flags there. So I do really think it's a matter of sitting down with leadership and setting the tone um, because ultimately th they stand for something and I know they want to stand for good. I don't know if you could hear me because you have problems uh, with the sound in this broadcast, but I would like to go now maybe to um, maybe to Dor. And, and Dor, I, I know that, that what you've tried to do does not refer only to working with, you know, this fan group that you described, but rather you are working also with young people and, and trying to, uh, you know, uh, educate them and, and, and bring them into the fold of, of uh, you know, more tolerance. Yes, I want to comment first on what uh, Anthony said. I think it's very much right. The only one thing I want to add is that the, the, the majority of moderate fans can only fight the radical few if they feel they are backed and protected by uh, I don't know, the police. So I don't know if, the, if saying the police is is, is the political right <laughs> is, is PC now, but if they are backed by the police, by the owners, uh, by the government, and they're not working as as as, as the sole uh, initiative in that issue. Um, and to answer your question. I would say that we are trying to form a different group of moderate anti-racist people to fight the racist group. Um, we're not dealing much with the racist group itself because every attempt to do so was uh, backfired by violence 
um, also because we didn't have the protection and the back from the owners, the police and uh, the government. And one other thing that I want to say is the way that we describe is ourselves, we don't say that we are anti-racist. We simply say we are not racist. And that's a very important nuance for me. We, we, we don't feel there's any uh, virtue in being simply not racist. Uh, so we don't want to celebrate our anti-racism. We say, this is the normal situation. Just don't be racist. Um, so this is what we are trying to do is to, because we didn't have the protection in our home club, as the, 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 the examples that Anthony mentioned, we try to do it outside of our home club, in a different club. Yeah, thank you, thank you Dor. Um, so um, I see that uh, Pavel uh, would like to add something. Yes, thank you, Vlad. Well, I would like to, to largely echo what, what Anthony said, although pointing at uh, one very interesting aspect of that in Europe, uh, while fan groups are, are very organized and it's, you know, it certainly uh, would have a big impact if, if you could work with them and educate and ideally the fans could self-regulate. So basically find the people who are doing the monkey noises and, you know, exert influence on them, you know, as a form of peer pressure. But unfortunately, in many places across Europe, uh, the organized fans have races almost as part of their fan identity, if you wish. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you, uh, you know how it started, you know, with the 1970s in Britain when the far-right political parties have organized among uh, football fans and then it spreads across Europe, in Italy, in Czech Republic, Poland and across Central and Eastern Europe. And the organized far-right groups are often dominating the, the stands. Although they are a minority in the stadium, they are dominating most of the time with violence as well. So in order to, to engage the positive part of the, of the supporters and in order to work with them together, you first need to exclude the perpetrators. It might sound rough, but there is no possibility of an alternative of a progressive fan movement uh, the one, by the way, we see in, in many MLS clubs these days. Uh, the fans in, in the US in soccer are way more progressive than in most places in Europe. So in order to have that, you first need to provide space uh, for positive fans. And, and for that, you need to eliminate the threat. So regulation is very important as well. The clubs need to have the guts to confront their own fans, which is very difficult. They need to act every time there is a racist incident in the stadium. They need to sanction the, the, the national associations, the clubs, the leagues. They need to act. You know, it's sometimes, you know, education is certainly the answer, but it's sometimes very easy to say education and do nothing. So you need to understand specifically who you want to educate and how. If you look at 30, 40 year old people, in an organized far-right group in the stadium, they don't necessarily want to be educated and they're doing racist things, not because they don't know that racism you know, is abhorrent, but because that's part of their identity now. And these people need to be dealt with also with regulatory means, including with interventions and law enforcement and to create space for positive fan culture. Yeah, and, and uh, to add to your example, I know, uh, for example, in Romania, one of the leaders of, of fan clubs that actually were expressing themselves in the ways that you described became actually the leader of one, you know, extreme right political party. So, so, so it, it went the other way, you know, it, it went from sports into, into politics with, with, you know, harmful, uh, you know, consequences, but definitely, you know, the, the phenomena that you describe are are, um, are, are relevant. And Tony was saying in the chat room that, you know, what you described as a solution, uh, it was what was successful in, in, in Berlin. I'd like to go uh, now maybe to, to Julia to ask her if, if she notices there in Brazil, the same type of phenomena and, and how it is, you know, uh, uh, dealt with. Yes, Brazil is a 
country that's really passionate about football specifically. Uh, other sports have their space, but it's more of a niche. Football is really, really big here in Brazil, as you all know, probably. <laughs> so uh, here specifically, when you talk about racism and these discussions, this uh discussions about the importance of fighting racism, uh, the way it really struck out to the, to the fan communities, to fan groups, was when the clubs were affected. So if you have racist chants in the stadium, the club may lose points or the club may be relegated. So this was what really you know, reached out to people, uh, probably not for the best reasons, but at least they were not, they were regulating themselves. So if someone started uh, making monkey noises in the stadium, for example, the other fans would go, no, no, stop it because our team is going to lose because of this, not because they are people and they need to be respected, but it's a start. And then when you, you at least make this, this space feel more, uh, welcoming to players, feel more safe to players and to supporters uh, who are people of color, who are um, of different communities. The same thing happens, for example, with uh, homophobic chants or, or, you know, when when the fans start to regulate themselves, it starts to regulate themselves, they create a better, uh, uh, safer environment for these communities. But at the same time, it's not going to the root of the pro problem. It's just, you know, trying to make it a little bit safer. And then you go into educating and then you go into, uh, for example, clubs making campaigns on, on our uh, Day of Black Conscience that today here in Brazil. And some clubs were not participating on it uh for years and then uh, especially since the last three, four years, uh, all of the elite clubs were uh, making statements or creating jerseys that are black and with you know positive messages. And they are starting to realize that it's, it's right and it's important to position themselves that if you don't do anything, you are being complacent with the aggressors and they knew few uh they are starting to say like no this is not this club is a club for all so you cannot be racist here because if you are you are not welcome so it's really it's really interesting it's a work in progress yeah uh, definitely uh, now if, if dr francois uh, 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 here is us uh, you know, so in South Africa, everything has more kind of a historical context. But what can you tell us a little bit about this idea, kind of a dynamic between sports and fans and, you know, uh, towards, uh, you know, throughout history in, in terms of dealing with racism? If you could hear. Yes. <clears throat> um, my, my research hasn't dealt much with the issue of fan culture, but what I've picked up, um, from 1995 onwards, there hasn't been that much kind of, of tension between um, blacks and whites on, on fans. What has happened is that sport has become extremely commercialized. And your uh, top ranks, your elite games has become privatized as, 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 as has become uh, sold to uh, private media corporations so that your, your fan clubs that you have, your fan clubs have for, for many, many of the top sport clubs is now a virtual, a, a virtual fan club. Um, rugby in, part, in particular, um, rugby is followed largely virtually. Um, Soccer, uh, during the apartheid years, um, soccer in the black community was, was big. Uh, your um, big corporates, especially your, your beer making, uh, sponsored, sponsored black soccer and teams such as Kaiser Chiefs and, oh, and oh, oh, Orlando Pirates had a big uh, fan base following. Um, but the, 
a division, to be honest, during apartheid years, the, the division between black and white wasn't that much obvious in, in the fan base in soccer. The, your, fan base, your fan base for your major black clubs remained black. So the, so the kind of, uh, of islands, as it were, that, that did happen, um, fan, base, fan base violence was violence due to support for the club or due to personal, personal conflict. Um, but the apartheid fissures uh, didn't, didn't surface that much during the uh, apartheid years for the fan base for the soccer. There were, there were slight incidents after 1995 uh, years. Um, there was a famous incident, or certainly famous, it was a well-reported incident of where a black rugby player was killed on the field. Um, there's still occasional, ins uh, the occasional reports where there is, um, where there is remarks made, racist remarks made, but it is not on the same scale as what we hear here tonight, what happens in uh, Britain and in the uh, northern, northern hemisphere. Yeah, I, I let's ask a question now. Um, you know, I, I was trying to convince Nora Dooley to come on microphone, but uh, I wasn't persuasive enough from coaches ac across continents. A an amazing organization, actually coaches across continents does a whole set of programs dealing specifically exercises for, for young people to in relation to this type of phenomena that we are talking about. What, what Nora is asking um, and echoing, you know, she says, she says Papu's question about, are we too focused on comp the competitive nature of, of, of the game, the kind of professional game, uh, that you forget teaching fundamental life skills to youth and children. So I would like to, uh, you know, to focus the discussion right now of what we can do outside the I mean, professional sports not ignoring the role model, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the professional sports, uh, but, you know, what we can do at early ages in, in terms of programs, in terms of, you know, uh, persuading, in terms of even, you know, in connection to what is so popular right now among young people, social media, you know, in order to, to uh, develop eventually players, fans that have, uh, you know, a more, more inclusive, uh, you know, uh, um, approach to, to this to these issues so let's let's start with uh, you know Tony again and, and and let's we'll go through to the panel well and and um, we're big fans of coaches across continents and I've worked with them in some of our programs in Haiti and even have brought them to Minnesota you know I think it's different everywhere you go in the world but you know so I just want that 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 caveat but um, you know we don't we don't teach soccer right we're, we're a youth development organization. So I think when we start at the grassroots level of all sports, it's developing people. And so if sports is a place where you can develop good people, um, just like a school, we can use and develop social emotional competencies in young people um, and teach them about an inclusive place being a more positive place uh, for success. And so I do think, you know, as we teach, it has to be more about developing um, the skills and the people and less about winning from a young age. And so I, I think it's a both and it's like, you know, if there's a flood and you have a leaky roof, water can come in both ways. So you have to do both or you're going to have water in your house. But working with working with children, I think, is is uh, is very important. And, and I would like to racism is learned and it's usually learned by by um, by people older than us in our environment. So if we can use social media to teach people that it's wrong, um, if we can create inclusive environments so that people understand there's people from other countries and different different things it's it's great so you know it's really about about creating more inclusive learning environments that are that are safe um and that we work with our youth in a, a, as we develop them so again the project we're doing with common goal we, we will be working with adults and professional but it's really about the grassroots and let's not forget which might be different in america than the rest of the world in America, especially, the parents are the way that they're involved in youth sports have a big impact on the outcomes and what they say on the sidelines, what they say when they're driving to the game, how they act around their kids. So the training of these social emotional competencies isn't just with the kids, it's with the whole family and the club and the referees as well. 
And actually, we are planning to do a whole webinar about the role of parents in sports, which obviously plays differently in different environments. But it's a very important, very important component. So, you know, same, same questions, you know, briefly, we have uh, time for more questions for the rest of the panelists. Door, so what do you think? Young people, that means, you know, how, how do you shape them in order to, to avoid, you know, to, to, make, to make a more inclusive future? It's a big question. I feel the political atmosphere has a big role in shaping the young people's minds. Um, more so in um, more tension areas such as Jerusalem. I would say that the familia, the, the radical group that uh, took over our stands, didn't come from out of nowhere. Um, they, have, they do much, 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 much of uh, field work in, uh, in, the, in the streets. Every, every night in Jerusalem, they are uh, approaching young people and trying to influence their agenda uh, into the political issues. And later on, they invite them into the stands. So they are not they are not waiting for us uh, um, to shape the young people's mind. Um, I would say that education has a big part of it. I don't know how to put the ed education into the stands. That, that's the main uh, struggle. I, um, we did some meetings between uh, our uh, kids and youth groups with the Arab people, Arab teams. Um, but I don't know how to make the, the, the education into the stance. That's what I'm struggling in. Yeah. Um, Julia, you, you are a member of the media. And, and obviously, uh, media has an important role in, in uh, you know, educating the public and raising these type of issues. So, so what can you tell us about, about you know, the role of the media, how it plays in Brazil? It's really interesting to, to pay attention of how the media the, develops the coverage of racism cases, cases. Like I mentioned the observatory. So before the observatory started cataloging these, these uh, discrimination cases uh, back in 2014, uh, the media was incisive, but not uh, really interested. So it was something like the, if there was a big case, a huge case involving, for example, a Brazilian player who plays in Europe uh, who suffered racism, then the media will go, oh, no, this is wrong. But here in Brazil, if something like that happened, uh, there were mostly white men commentating on the issue and saying that, oh, no, you need to think about the football. Uh, oh, no, you cannot stop a game because of uh, uh, a chant or it's just tradition of uh, uh, the supporters, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, they're just joking around. But then after the observatory started cataloging these cases, after uh, started to have more black people working on the sports media, some players started to, to uh, speak up about it then it's it's changing. You still have a little challenges, like um, for example, people who still dismiss uh, racism cases in Brazil, but at the same time, uh, when you start uh, to pay attention to the coverage, it's uh, they are not only mentioning it, not only uh, talking about it, but also repressing it. So uh, you see journalists in the media, in the TV saying, no, this is wrong, this has to stop. Uh, journalists who, a narrator who said he wouldn't, he would stop narrating the game until the chain stopped. So it's really interesting to see how, how the media has been positioning uh, about it. Uh, Dr. Francois, so obviously, um, you know, again, there is a historical context in, in, in South Africa, which is very, very important. But what can you tell us about the, the young people of today? You know, how they relate to this and, and, and you know, what type of, obviously South Africa had a very interesting way to deal with racism, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and everything that has happened there, which was pretty unique. And, and, you know, the whole world looked with respect of what was going on. You know, how does, does this translate into the young generation in relation to sports? 
uh, when it comes to the issue of racism? Um, look, the young generation today is caught up in the commercial corporate culture um, to them. For many of them, the events that happened before 1994 is not important anymore. Um, for many of them, for black and for white, what is important for them is to find a good job, to have the latest cell phone, to have the best job. So if incidents such as the Black Lives Matter surface, um, many of them are caught, uh, are caught, are caught with uh, not knowing what to do. Uh, the young people don't have a political consciousness anymore like we had um, prior to 1994. Yeah. Um, the, question, the question that you ask is what can be done? Um, prior to 1994, in the former white schools and a large number of the so-called colored schools, we had a strong physical education program. In 1994, this physical education programs was wiped out um, and there is political reasons for that. But I think if we reintroduce physical education as a compulsory subject in the schools, we, we deliberately teach young people racism is wrong. Uh, this, this. It seemed that we lost sound again. Anna? Yeah, I think he again has problems with the internet. So maybe you could go to the next question and, and then. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll go to the next question. We have a um, very good question from Darlene Kluka. He's asking how the sporting community can contribute to trans transformation of sport to accept and reflect diversity as a strength for development of the world. So how can we people involved in sports can work together to end this issue? Because this is going for many, many years. And uh, let's hear from our speakers what they think. Julia, let's start from you. Yeah, so uh, the, the diversity issue is really uh, different here in Brazil than in other countries because of the lots and lots of miscegenations and people who are, uh, and the idea that, uh, for example, when you reach out to, when you take a look at the, the importance of having black people people don't usually think about, uh, we have to have black people in all of the you know, levels, you know? The only thing, oh no, we have, our team is mostly black players, so we have diversity in our team. But when you think about the manager position or the president of the club position or some, some jobs that require more uh, specialized skills, they often don't go to even goalkeeper, even goalkeeper, they usually don't go to, to black players. So it's really here in Brazil, you think about diversity, you look at the country and you see, oh, it's 50 50. It's amazing, but it's not. Um, when you look, and it reflects on every sphere of the country. So not only in sports, but also in politics, in teaching positions, in the media. Uh, for example, it's really curious and bad to see that, uh, for example, in the sporting media, there are women re getting to power positions now, getting in the TV and commentating and not only being the reporter, but also giving their own opinion. But at the same time, it's usually white women. So uh, the, the, you know, diversity in Brazil is a tricky question because when you think about a, a topic, then you go, oh no, we need to do to go further, we need to do more. Thank you, Tony. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a dual end. I mean, like, you know, sports can help change, you know, racism in our society, but first we need to, you know, make sports a more inclusive environment to begin with. And I think that it can be a place, an artistic place to set an example for the rest of society if we use it, if we use it for, 
for a positive in a positive setting. So I do think that we have, you know, now everybody has a voice because of social media, but you know, sports has a platform. Um, and so we need to use that platform and it, people tune in. So, you know, from the players to the participants, it's something that, that a big part of the world takes part in on some level as a player, a fan, um, or a participant. So um, we do need to change the culture within sports and be the model example and then amplify that message um, to the rest of the world. And hopefully it, 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 it's athletes and it can start making small changes. And you saw that sort of with, you know, a guy like Colin Kaepernick, although persecuted in a hundred years from now, he, he may be looked at as a hero. Thank you, Tony. Pavel? Well, I think uh, he certainly will be looked at as a hero. And uh, mentioning social media, it's it's another big platform where, where athletes uh, can speak out, but they're also facing increasing waves of discriminatory abuse, racist, homophobic, and sexist messages uh, that are coming in, you know, after every match, basically, or after every statement that players are making. So this is something that we're looking into as well and uh, trying to, to influence social media companies to uh, moderate their, their content better and to, to step in and change the culture of the conversations. You know, we can talk about regulations, state regulations, and uh, making social media companies more responsible for what is being posted on their platforms. And just to come back on the uh, on the grassroots sport, basically, uh, education through play, through sport. Uh, we need to remember, I think, that sport in itself, although it has many benefits, you know, for both physical as well as uh, as uh, mental development of children, uh, it needs something to be built on top of it. First, you need to organize sporting activities, provide a safe space, but you also need to shape a way in which they are being conducted. You need to cherish diversity and teach the values, uh, you know, uh, organizing mixed teams with, with boys and girls as well. Uh, teach how to behave and how to how to interact with the diversity and be diverse in in the teams as well. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize those that sport can be a basis, a universal language, but it needs building on top of it as a as an educational tool. We're now talking a lot about sport as a tool for preventing radicalization in many societies, you know. But playing sport does not in itself prevent anything or contribute to, to anything. It needs building on top those building bricks. Thank you, Pavel. And Dor? Dor, can you hear me? Yes, well, what was the question again, sorry? How can the sporting community influence to change uh, like, how can we help uh, the, to fight against racism, the sporting community? What we should do? I think changing ideas is a big uh, starting point, which is the, the panel is uh, very helpful. Um, yeah, we, we can learn from each other. I think um, every scenario is very, very different, but very, very similar. Um, uh, what Anthony said about uh, Berlin, Berlin uh, fans was, I felt like talking about my, my issue, although everything is very, very different, but maybe the thing that I'm different with uh, Anthony is what I'm similar with uh, Julia. Um, so this is a good start. So we have, I don't know, uh, Anna, can you hear, can you hear me? I'm not sure if anybody could hear me. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can. Okay, so we have two, two, uh, two hands raised. So please, uh, if you could make the kind of um, 
Uh, let's start with Obiora Victor, it is one of our audience, but, but briefly, please, please, to be able to actually okay. see another. Uh, um, good evening, everyone from Nigeria here. Um, Your microphone is, you could, we could barely hear you, so if you could speak louder or closer to the microphone. Okay. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Amadi Obiora from Nigeria, I, President of American for Africa Mission. Um, my, my uh, uh, contribution is, uh, my is kind of a, con a comment, a contribution towards racism. I feel that um, before we can tackle racism, we need to go from the origin of what racism stands for, uh, how it got started. Um, the closest link for me when I think about racism is about the new colonialism, you know, how did this new colonialist colonized Africa and made things so worse for the people of Africa. Like to today, we still have hands from this new colonialist, you know, having hands to control what is happening over here in Africa. Now, going back to sport, because where, where we are concerned now is not in the political aspect of it now, but in the sport aspect of it. I want to understand what the rationale why in Africa, like talking about soccer, we have about 54 countries, 53 to 54 countries in Africa. But we only have just five people, five um, representation, five nations representing Africa, you know, in, in, in the world in the world stage. I think there are some modalities that the world has already put in place that are enabling racism to 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 pop up. They might not be racist, they might not be racist in the in their in the essence, but those modalities aid racism. So where you have just five representation from Africa representing the world in the World Cup, where and other continents are having like up to 10 and, and so forth. I think that also, you know, aid in, in that racism, where you have those little blacks, you know, playing the World Cup and the rest of them. I think for we to clear about, to be clear about racism, we need to bring about equality because some people feel they are more equal than others. And that is why I feel that uh, racism is still uh, a big problem that we have today. Yeah, Thank you very much. It's a global problem. Thank, thank you, Obiora. So I see another hand. Uh, I, might, uh, I apologize for mispronouncing. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from Nigeria. My name is Mr. Madi Chukwemeka, founder of American Pope African Mission. It's good to be here on this topic concerning racism and sports. Uh, peculiar, I'm going to speak concerning Africa, uh, ideally. Um, Africans, as Africans, we are more of you know, tribalized people. And when you're talking about racism, it's peculiar here in Africa where we have to deal with tribalism. We have to deal with bigotry, nepotism. Uh, the main fact of mentioning your names, our names, you know, give a lot of attribution, give a lot of insight about where you're coming from. And then when you have to play in the same team, uh, having to do with selections, where you have to play in a team where the coach does not belong from your tribe, it's a lot of, you know, uh, or acts in the sense that, you know, you're getting selected sometimes, not because of your ability, but because of where you're coming from. And then it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, serious issue in the sense that, you know, for us to be able to stamp out racism, we need to see a common stand where our, our, our diversity become a strength for us in the sense that, you know, there should be inclusion. Everybody needs to be particip participating in, uh, in, in that. Everybody needs to be accepted. People need to see themselves as one people. So racism for me is not just about white nor black or Asian or wherever you're coming from. It could also be in silence mode in the sense that people turn a blind eye to things that are happening in the club. People turn a blind eye to things like happening in everywhere we find ourselves. We need to be able to speak up. People need to stand up for it. People need to stand up and then kick out racism in the sense that we need not to fold our hands. We need not turn a blind eye to it. Now, we need to be able to get back to where it all started from. Morality. That's where I'm looking at for me. Morality, where kids are not taught the right types of morality to be moral. You know, there should be a kind of institutionalized morality where people get back to what it looks to be sanity, you know, to be sane, uh, 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 to, uh, sanity in all aspects of it, or in the sense that you know the right and what is wrong and then stick to things that are right. And then that way, in that way, we can be able to start teaching. You know, uh, it's gonna be a long, long process, but then we gotta start from the kids, you know, teaching them the right morals. And that, by, by that way, we can be able to stamp out the rest is incomplete from our sports. Uh, thank you very much for this time, yeah. Thank you, very good point. And, and it's extremely interesting to look this at the global and the global stage, because while there are differences, you know, historical and, and all kinds of differences, you know, countries and, and, and people have so much in common. 
and and I would I would refer to something that Darlene Klocka uh, wrote uh, in in the in the website in in the chat. Uh, there appears to be two issues: one of inclusion and one of discrimination against those who are different from the majority. In some regions of the world, diversity means religion. In other, uh, it means race. In other, it means sex or gender. So, so the whole point is that you know the, the 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 real issue is, as you said, the moral issue. And the real issue is uh, is inclusion, inclusion of all kinds. And and when the inclusion of all kinds is going to be, you know, dealt with properly and better understood and better, in, you know, included in, in emerging in what we do, uh, the world is going to be a, a probably probably a better better place, including including in sports. I would like before going to uh, you know Ryan Ryan Murphy. Uh, from sports diplomacy, I would like to go one more time, uh, you know, to the panelists. And you know, so if I, for example, if I'm, you know, some kind of a world leader, and I will ask you in one sentence to tell me, you know, what would be the main priority? That means I have to deal with races being sports through sports, and I need from you one idea. That means you know, one thing that needs to happen in 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 your vision, you know, in in the near future, in order to actually make a difference. In this field, in order in order to to actually create an environment that is going to become uh, inclusive, and you know, while we're, we're thinking at, at, about this, obviously we have met plenty of examples. You know, as I said at the beginning, from MBA to UEFA, and by the way, UEFA, you know, supported us in in doing this webinar uh, by recommending speakers. Um, you know, everybody is trying to actually make a contribution because the issue is very pressing. The issue is is right now. Very evident, you know, is very visible and you know, painfully, hurtfully uh, visible. So, what what do you think, you know, can in one sentence to that would be your recommendation for the future, you know, as a as a world leader in sports, uh, in what needs to be done? So, so, but again, very briefly, because we have only little time. So, let's start uh, with with Julia. I believe it's funding. Funding for every project, you need funding. People are working uh, with uh, the the with passion and with interest and working for free sometimes to change this reality. But if there was a world leader who decided the funding for every project, I believe there would be more funding to to raise awareness to these issues and to educate people and to do all the solutions we talked about in the webinar. Yeah. So we, without without suggesting to, that there is a world leader, because this would be a conspiracy. <laughs> the, the idea is, you know, what would be that one thing that you would like to focus on? So let's go to to Francois. So what 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 do you think? Um, maybe I want to tie in with what the previous speaker said. I will agree with her, but I'll go but further. I will want to eliminate uh, poverty because poverty breeds distrust between people. Poverty breeds desiring what the next person has. And that lays a foundation for all kinds of social uh, badness. So I will address the issue of, of poverty. Uh, Dor, um, you, you mentioned obviously that, you know, politics plays, um, you know, a role, more of a role in certain regions. And maybe not the others. And actually, you know, politics and sports is going to be the topic of one of our uh, future webinars. So, so we'll invite you all because it's a fascinating uh, uh, subject. But you know, same question. You know, one thing that you think that that might make sense to do uh, in order to make a difference, actually, in, in this very uh, complicated, um, you know, topic of you know more inclusion, less racism. I think uh, racist groups follow no rules. They don't care about their PR. They don't care about uh, what to follow the structure or, or rules. And it's very hard to fight them because they're often very determined and they often put their political agenda uh, on top of their uh, sportive, sportive uh, agenda. And I would say that the first thing that you need to do is to be more determined than them because the silent majority, which says like, okay, I, 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 see, I see racism, I, I denounce racism, but I don't know if I can do something with it. This is the problem. You have to be more determined than them. This is the first step because they are very determined. 
they wouldn't bunch even a bit. Yeah. That's, that's why I think. That, yeah, very good point. And it applies to societies in general, you know, beyond, beyond sports. That's the case. It's not necessarily the, you know, the silent majority is a majority, but that minority is definitely noisier and, 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 and you know, more striking. Uh, Pavel, what do you think about, about this idea? Uh, your, your, your recipe for the world of sports. Well, one thing I want to suggest is representation. When the governing boards of every sport would reflect the diversity of our communities and the diversity of our sports, the athletes that, that play it, we will see better programs designed. We will see better reaction to, to incidents happening. We will see better protection of victims. So my take is representation. Definitely. And it's interesting that, you know, that there are kind of complementary ideas that you all, you all put on the, ta on the table. So, you know, hopefully the, the so-called world leader is, 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 is listening. Tony, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's not that simple. So as one thing is we can't try to fix it with one thing and we have to be inclusive. And um, so that would be my, my biggest piece of advice. And then, you know, since you brought up Ryan's name, I think, you know, what, what he does and what we do together with the State Department is create mutual understanding. So um, create mutual understanding across the world um, so that we get to know each other a little bit better. But there is no one solution. I think we have to attack it from a lot of angles. And hopefully this webinar uh, contributes to that. that. This was the whole idea behind bringing, uh, you know, people from, from all over the world, because these experiences are, are many ways complementary and, and your common thoughts are, are, are important. And people like you and or people like, you know, we mentioned, uh, you know, Corsica's continents, other organizations, they do this globally. And, and so there are lessons to be learned from each each experience that might apply to, to the other thing. But, you know, before going, going to, to, to Ryan, uh, what do you think about, you know, you are in Minneapolis right now, obviously, you know, Minneapolis in, in you know, for all, or, you know, not necessarily good reasons is in the news these days. So what do you think, you know, talking to people, you know, abroad, talking to your friends, talking to all kinds of communities, is this well understood what is going on in, in these days in, 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 in Minneapolis? I think so. Um, but again, um, you know, we, we are, we are not looking at, we're looking at the, the end game. We're not looking at this, you know, it's the symptoms. We're not looking at the root causes. So at, at some point, you know, you know, if you don't eat well, you'll get injured. Right. And so we haven't been treating, you know, globally. And, um, although we are polarized to what's happening in Minneapolis, let's be clear that, you know, this is a global issue. Um, and so, you know, we can point out and point fingers at who does it better, but none of us do it well enough. Um, so living here, uh, I think it's it's a wake up call. I think, you know, the videos were, were so um, in your face, but then again, you have a situation like Myanmar where, where maybe we don't get the videos. Maybe some of the, you know, some of it is oppressed. So we just don't get the information. So. Um, and so social media has allowed us to share that information. And right now um, it's being streamed from Minneapolis. Definitely. So uh, as Tony mentioned, obviously um, what sports diplomacy, the State Department division that actually uh, we work with for these programs is, is, is amazing in terms of impact, in terms of um, you know, possibilities to influence minds and souls. So um, Ryan, if you are with us, Maybe you'd like to add a few words? Yeah, first and foremost, thank you all to the panelists and to the participants and everyone who joined this webinar. It's obviously such a, an important topic right now and always. Um, and it, I'm happy that we were able to get so many of our great partners and, and program participants involved in this discussion. Uh, as Tony said, and, and Vlad, uh, stated as well, the purpose of the U.S. Department of State's programs is mutual understanding. It's really to bring communities together through sports. Now, the bureau that I work in, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, we not only use sports to bring communities together and engage in people-to-people -people exchanges, we do it through arts, music, culture, dance, food, academic programs, 
So we're using, as the U.S. government, we're using all these different methods to bring communities together. And a lot of the programs that we do and some of the ones that Tony has traveled out on as a sports envoy, he might be the only American that this underserved, underprivileged group overseas has ever met or has ever engaged in. And through his stories and through his experiences and him sharing that story, it really gets the participants overseas to open up and to learn more about Americans and vice versa. I'm sure through all these trips, Tony has learned a lot from the foreign participants that he's engaged with. And we do this through the International Sports Programming Initiative very well also, because these are two-way exchanges. So we are not only sending Americans overseas, but we're also bringing foreign participants to U.S. communities all around the United States. So we really do establish this linkage between people to people, but organization to organization, NGO to NGO, or government to government. So really these programs do help to strip away all the political nature of things and get down to really just people being people and really sharing their stories. Um, one thing that the panelists and especially Dor had kind of talked about was really what we all can do. And that's, I think, what really gets to the, to the cause and the, the root of all this is that we all need to do our own little part in rectifying the situation or, or chipping away at the situation. Don't wait for the governments or the teams or the clubs or anyone else to do their part or to really dictate what you should be doing. Go out and do what little you can do in your communities. Um, one thing that's really a huge part of American culture and society is volunteerism. And just going out, sharing your story, helping out with your local communities, get outside your own comfort zone and really share your experiences and engage with others. I feel like that's a great thing that we try to instill in all of our programs. Um, and we have so many examples and a lot of you on, on this webinar have been part of those programs. So it's just great for us to share the, our stories and, and do it in a positive light. So again, I just wanna thank everyone for being a part of this panel. Uh, it's obviously a discussion that's gonna be ongoing. Uh, it's probably one of many conversations that are going on in this topic, but through all the webinars that we're learning and Vlad and his team have done, they all are opportunities to build on each other and share those experiences. So thank you all for being a part today. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, people participating in the program, you know, that there might be many, that means, you know, right now that I cannot, but in addition to, you know, Tony, uh, you mentioned Dor also is participated in our program, you know, Nora, who asked the question, Firat, Matt, there are many. So, so this proves that, that, you know, these programs are effective in the sense that they bring people around this, these important ideas and they want to continue to work together because at the end of the day, you know, sports is the place for inclusion. There is no, you know, place for racism in societies or in sports. And as Ryan said, as Tony said, as all the panelists said, actually, um, you know, we could do this only together. And that's the reason we, we, uh, we are arranging, we are organizing these webinars. And that's the reason, hopefully, you know, after COVID, we could actually meet in person and do, uh, do again our exchanges all over, all over the world. So I would like to, to thank, uh, first of all, the panelists. That is, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but you could say that we won our you know, battle struggle with technology. That means you know, we, could, uh, we could actually hear from all of you. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, all panelists for being with us, taking the time for this important topic. Um, obviously, you know, grateful to Ryan Sports Diplomacy, other organizations actually supported this. I mentioned WEFA a little bit earlier, who um, recommended um, also the, the, the speaker from, from Europe. Uh, I would like to thank uh, you know, my co-moderator, Anna, our team at World Learning, Aaron, Laurel, Nicole, Juliana, and, and Jennifer. And I would like only one thing, uh, if Anna or somebody else could actually post uh, you know, the map of people who registered for this webinar. I'm not sure if it's possible. Is it possible, Anna? Or, or Aaron? Exactly, okay, so look at this map. 
So the map uh, reflects the people who participated in this in this webinar, and you see that it's basically all over the world, all continents. Unfortunately, Australia is still, probably they're sleeping. It's too, it's too late there. So this is the reflection of the level of interest for this topic in our in our in our community and and uh, and this map is probably very hopeful in the sense that we are trying to to build together something solid inclusive where races has no place so again thank you um, uh, to everybody uh, this has been a webinar uh, under the uh, international sports programming initiative of the state department sports diplomacy division produced by world learning thank you and we'll see you in two weeks for another webinar. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.